Saint Francis of Assisi was passing through a town in Italy. The town's name was Lombardy. And the town was in an uproar. There was commotion because the town's priest left the church and started living with a woman, a mistress. So people were asking, how are we going to receive the sacraments? How will our children be baptized? Who's going to lead our parish? So the townspeople heard St. Francis was passing through, so they thought, St. Francis is a living saint. We should ask him to talk to the priest so he can convince him to come back to the church and celebrate the sacraments again. So they went up to St. Francis and they told him the story and he agreed. He agreed to go talk to the priest. Now, as he approached this woman's house where the priest was living, it seemed like the whole town was behind him. They were angry that their father, their spiritual father, left them. So they thought he's going to really admonish him. He's going to tell him that if he doesn't stop doing what he's doing, he's going to go to hell. So St. Francis knocked on the door of this woman's house, and guess who answered the door? It was the priest. And as St. Francis saw the priest as he opened the door, the first thing St. Francis did was kneel down and kiss his hands. And he said, all I know and all I want to know is that these hands give me Jesus. When the priest witnessed St. Francis kissing his hands, he had a conversion. And it was said that he stopped living his life, his sinful life with the mistress, and he did penance for his sins. Now, why do I tell you this story? Well, it not only highlights the importance of the priesthood, but it also explains that the priesthood exists for the Eucharist. No priesthood, no Eucharist. No Eucharist, no Jesus. No Jesus, no heaven, no life. I am up here preaching to all of you as a priest for the blessed sacrament. My hands were consecrated during the ordination rite to offer the sacrifice of the Eucharist. We were baptized, all of us, were baptized to be united with God, especially in the most blessed sacrament of the altar. There is nothing better in this world. There is nothing more important on this planet than the Eucharist. We can't do anything more meaningful in our lives besides actually attending one Mass and receiving Jesus in Holy Communion. So the Eucharist is literally the source of our lives. We exist, we continue to exist with the Eucharist because the Eucharist is Jesus himself. Everything was created in and through him, and he sustains us in our being. Not only that, the end goal of every one of our actions, our thoughts, our everything should be directed toward the Eucharist. 
it is the summit, the culmination, the highest point of our lives, especially as Catholic Christians. The Eucharist transforms us into Jesus Christ. We become more like our Lord every time we receive Christ in the most blessed sacrament of the altar. Ultimately, the Christian vocation is to become who we receive every time that we're in the state of grace and we receive Holy Communion at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Now, with that being said, all of the sacraments give grace. You know this. The definition of a sacrament is an external sign that gives grace. That is the life of God, divine life. Every sacrament does that. Whether it's baptism, whether it's confirmation, or the anointing of the sick, every sacrament gives grace. But when we're talking about the Eucharist, that is the most blessed sacrament, it's not just simply grace, it's the author of grace himself. God, in his totality, that is his divinity, is present within that small sacred host. So we're not just talking about grace here, we are talking about God himself. So when we're celebrating a day, such as Corpus Christi, we need to realize that Christ in his totality is present in the Eucharist. Not simply his humanity, that is his body, blood, and true human soul, all parts that he received in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary when she gave her fiat, but we're also talking about his divinity. Literally, what the heavens and the earth cannot contain is within that small host that looks like bread. And we know he shares the divinity with the Father and the Holy Spirit. So in a certain sense, we can say God is completely in the Holy Eucharist. So the same Jesus that healed the sick, that gave sight to the blind, that walked on water about 2,000 years ago is the exact same Jesus currently in this tabernacle. The same Christ who forgives our sins in confession, who raises people from the dead, who completes us as human beings is the exact same Christ that will be on this altar after the words of consecration. The same God who knows our every thought, who knows the future, certainly knows the past, who will judge us immediately after we die from this world is the exact same God that will be given to you in Holy Communion in about 43 minutes. So with all of this in mind, why isn't this chapel full? Why aren't churches around the world, why aren't they packed to capacity? If Jesus is truly here, and he is, then we should be with Jesus as much as we can. Why is it at times we have to force our family members to come with us to church? They think it's, it's such a burden to them to actually come to Mass on Sundays, if they really knew that Jesus was here, they wouldn't complain. Now, with all of this, again, being said, first and foremost, what God is asking us to do is to go against our senses. Everything that we know in life, we have learned by our eyes, by hearing with our ears, by touching and tasting. All knowledge, one philosopher says, comes through the senses. But if you simply go by the senses when we're talking about the Eucharist, all you're going to see is a piece of unleavened bread, this flat bread. To tell you the truth, it's really not that great of a bread that we use to consecrate the Eucharist. I mean, if I had my choice, I would choose Hawaiian bread. 
or I don't know, banana bread. There's so many other breads that we can use if it was just simply by our senses. But obviously, the Holy Eucharist takes faith. This is what differentiates people that have devotion to the Eucharist, whether or not they have faith. Divinely revealed by us, especially in sacred scripture, but especially through the teaching of the church, we know there is no longer bread. There is no longer wine. Only the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, which takes the form of bread and the form of wine. So at the end of the day, this is a valid question we should all ask ourselves on a solemnity as such. Are we Eucharistic people? If you were to ask yourself, are you a Eucharistic person? Would you emphatically say yes? Besides the obligatory Sunday Mass that we're all required to go to every week, do you pray a Eucharistic holy hour maybe at least once a month? I would recommend at least once a week. Do you read the readings of Sunday Mass and meditate on them during the week before you get to Mass on Sunday? This is a Eucharistic way to increase your spirituality toward Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Do you make spiritual communions throughout the day? Even if you're busy at work during a little break all you have to do is spend 30 seconds and make a spiritual communion toward the Blessed Sacrament. Do you do a morning offering uniting your thoughts, words, and actions in union with the sacrifice of Christ at Mass? If the answer is yes, then good. You are living a Eucharistic life. And then are you actually offering your well-done work throughout the week at this altar. Notice the priest says, pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. So what are you offering here at this altar? You know, at one point when I was a seminarian here in this community, I was struggling with my vocation to be a priest to offer the Eucharist. And what happened was this. I was my second year at the seminary, and I got a call from my older brother in California. And my older brother said, Joe, dad is really sick. He's literally blacking out, and he's falling down to the ground, and we don't know what's wrong with him. Can you please pray for us as we visit some doctors to get a diagnosis of what's going on? So I was praying for my father, and after about a few days, my older brother calls me back and he says, Joe, we just got back from the doctor's office, and we have now discovered dad is suffering from lung cancer. And he's already in his fourth stage. And the doctor just told me that he can die at any minute. So please pray for him. So I was told this. I was studying in Connecticut at Holy Apostles. My family was in California. And when I was told that, I wasn't at peace. I couldn't study. I couldn't pray. Community life wasn't the same, as well as recreation, because I didn't know whether my dad would live another day. So I felt like leaving. So I went to my spiritual director, and I said, Father, my dad can die at any second, and I feel like leaving, at least temporarily, to help my, my mother and my brother out as my father lives his last days. Is it God's will for me to leave and go back to California and help my father. And my spiritual director, he said, Brother Joseph, I'm sorry to hear what's happening with your father and your family. I will certainly pray for him, but I don't think it's God's will for you to leave. And this is what I want you to do for your father as he's about to die. And this is what he told me. This is the greatest advice 
that I have ever received in my life. He said, when you come to Mass, every time the priest consecrates the Eucharist, I want you to put yourself on the paten. I want you to put yourself in the chalice. That is, your anxieties, your worries, your rosaries, the liturgy of the hours, your whole being, I want you to put on the paten and in the chalice as Christ is being presented as a sacrifice to his father through the hands of the priest. And every time you put yourself on the paten and the chalice, after you receive Holy Communion, I want you to go back to your pew. You kneel down and you tell Jesus that you love him. But pray to Jesus not as if he was in the skies in heaven, so to speak. Pray because he's literally physically inside of you. And we know after we receive Holy Communion, the real presence of Christ, his physical presence, is within us for about 12 to 15 minutes before we digest him. So we're like living tabernacles. In a certain sense, we could put a, a red sanctuary lamp beside us after we receive Holy Communion. So he said, pray to Jesus, and I want you to offer Holy Communion for the health and well-being of your Father. If you do this, God will answer your prayers according to his will. So I was obedient, even though I wanted to go back to California, not knowing whether my father would live another day. I went to daily mass at Holy Apostles, and I offered Holy Communion after I put myself on that paten and in that chalice. As those bells were ringing at mass, that's what I was thinking. That's where my heart was. And I offered that Holy Communion for my father. Day after day, week after week, and even month after month passed as I prayed for my father in the Eucharist. And finally, one day, I get a call from my older brother, and he says, Joe, if you want to see dad before he dies, you need to get on an airplane right now and fly to California because he has less than 24 hours to live. So after I was told that, I ran directly to Father Jewel's room. I told my brother Jewel, if you want to see dad before he dies, we need to get on an airplane right now. We get permission from our superiors, and we fly out of Providence, Rhode Island. It was the first flight out. Unfortunately, it, wasn't, it was not a direct, nonstop flight. We had a stop actually in Nashville. Now, after we got off that plane, we ran directly to the payphones. Father Jewel was right beside me. And we called our older brother's cell phone. And we said, John, how is dad doing? Is he okay still? And while we were both listening on the phone, my brother said, I'm sorry to tell you, but dad has already passed away. Unfortunately, you won't be able to see him now that he's gone already. Very sad moment for our whole family. He died maybe at some point when we were flying over the the Midwest. So we didn't stop here. We continued to fly to California and we were taken directly to the hospital room where our father had just passed away. Now my whole family was there, not just my immediate family, my mom, my sister, and my brother, but even my dad's sisters, my cousins, and so forth and so on. So the first thing that Father Jewel and I do when we walk into the small hospital room, we kneel down and we say a prayer for the repose of the soul of our Father. If he's not in heaven, may, be, may he be in heaven now, in the beatific vision. After that, we obviously console our mother, who was crying, and the rest of our family. Now, after we were done with that, my older brother takes us both into the cafeteria of this large hospital, San Antonio Hospital, a hospital dedicated to St. Anthony. So he takes us and he says, Joe and Jewel, I want to tell you how dad died. 
two minutes after he pa- before he passed away, Father Pat came into the hospital room with viaticum. I don't know if you know what viaticum is. It's Holy Communion right before you die. So who will guide you to the gates of heaven? Jesus will. There's no better person to guide you to the gates of heaven, to your heavenly homeland, than our Lord himself. So Father Pat came in with the Blessed Sacrament. My whole family was there. It was completely silent. And you can see my dad was about to die because his vital signs were showing that he was ready to pass away. So our family didn't know whether our our father was conscious of what was going on in the room. So God bless my older brother, when Father Pat came in with the picks and the blessed sacrament, he yells from the top of his lungs, Dad, Jesus is here. And the little ounce of energy after my father heard him, he stuck out his tongue. And Father Pat put a very small Eucharistic particle on my father's tongue as he said, the body of Christ. And my father consumed the Holy Eucharist, and after about a minute, his last words were, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I love you. And then he passed away. Now, I couldn't have asked for a better way for my father to die from this world than to physically have Jesus inside of him when he died. Other than being a martyr, and we don't necessarily choose that, it's all in God's providence if he sets up that scenario, hopefully we'll say yes if that opportunity arises. Other than being a martyr, there is no better way to pass from this world than to pass with the sacraments, especially with Jesus physically inside of us when we die. So in a certain sense, I knew that my prayers were answered. Every time I went to Mass, I put myself on the patent, put myself in the chalice. God heard my Eucharistic plea. But my brother didn't stop there. So my older brother said, that's not it. This is also what happened. I was holding his left hand and mom was holding his right hand. My older brother's name is Jonathan or John, like St. John the Apostle. My mother's name is Maria Rosario, Mary of the Rosary. And because my dad had lung cancer, a lot of liquids built up in his lungs where it was hard for him to breathe. So what did the doctors have to do? They cut a slit in his side and liquids came out of his side. And do you know what liquids came out of my father's side? Blood and water. Now, if you know anything about the crucifixion scene, Jesus is hanging on the cross, standing by the cross where his mother, Mary, and his beloved disciple, John. And when our Lord died, his heart was pierced or his side was pierced with a lance and what came forth was blood and water. So when I was struggling with my vocation to become a priest, that is to offer the Eucharistic sacrifice, I know at least for myself, my father's holy death confirmed my vocation in the fathers of mercy. I can't necessarily speak for my brother. If you want to talk to him after this, you can ask him if that helped him in his priestly vocation. But I was very grateful that my father died a Eucharistic death. So today, Corpus Christi is a day to rededicate our lives to the Eucharist. There is nothing better that we can do in our lives. There is no safer way. There is no guaranteed path, a fail-safe way to get to heaven that is better than devotion to the Eucharist. 
So as St. Francis de Sales said, to overemphasize a life-changing point, we must visit Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament a hundred thousand times a day.